of, um, of the SRS, as it was in those days, between 1991 and 1993. And he died prematurely uh, from a heart attack in February 2002, with a lot of his life left to give. Uh, he was born in Sheffield. He trained in medicine at the University of Newcastle. And then subsequently, during his training, he spent two years under Sam Wells at Duke University in North Carolina. And there he developed an interest in endocrine surgery, which he subsequently took forward throughout his professional career. He was appointed as the Professor of Surgery in Bristol in 1988, uh, and there he took on an enormous administrative burden, and he's still greatly missed by the surgeons in Bristol. Derek Olson uh, was his close friend and colleague, and in one of his very rare lapses, uh, he appointed me as a senior lecturer there uh, subsequently. Now, um, John had, amongst his other burdens, he, he was the president of the British um, Association of Endocrine Surgeons, and at the time of his death, he was the uh, president-elect of the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland. I'm going to take the liberty just of reading you two sentences from his B and J obituary, and these really sum him up. He was universally respected and liked. His colleagues and juniors described him as patient, gentle, straightforward, committed, warm, humorous, approachable, caring, compassionate. He was kind, a good teacher, and interested in those around him. And the second sentence was that he could not have been more unlike the surgical stereotype. <laughs> We're very pleased today that Sir Christine Farnham's brave claims and the bad weather to come from Bristol to uh, attend this lecture. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask Professor Norman Williams to introduce introduce the uh, Farnham Lecture for 2010, Sir Nicholas Wright. Just to add to, John was a first friend of mine as well, and uh, his memorial uh, service was truly spectacular, with um, a huge number of people there from all walks of life, and he was a much loved person. And I speak uh, as president of SARS at the moment, but I'm sure that John would have been president also at some point, without any question. He's a great, was a great loss to, uh, to British surgery, and we all mourn him. And it's delightful to see Chris here today. Um, now to the uh, lecturer, um, who probably needs no introduction to some of you. Sir Nicholas Wright um, is the present warden of uh, Garth and the London, P. Mary. Uh, he came when, I have to say, P. Mary and the institution was in the doldrums. And he came from uh, Imperial and really changed the face of our institution. And, uh, and he's been a most magnificent supporter of surgery and surgeons. He is a pathologist, of course, so uh, that's always useful. Uh, Sir Nick, as we all call him, um, he has uh, held many positions in uh, the British medical um, firmament. He's been president of the uh, British Society of Gastroenterology and president of the Pathology Society. He's a foremost leader, in, world leader, in stem cells and their relationship to carcinoma. And he's made, and his group from uh, it's, uh, CRUK, and the uh, ICRF, uh, made some uh, absolutely phenomenal dis uh, discoveries in, in that area. And we're all, I'm sure, going to be um, very interested in what Sir Nick has to say. Sir Nick, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I knew John Farnham because I trained in Newcastle as well, and I hope we won't take the wrong way, but he was arguably the nicest surgeon I've ever met. <laughs> so it was a privilege to know him, and uh, the premature death was a, a terrible blow. <coughs> so, um, how do I change things? Um, well, I want to talk about stem cells, the origins of human cancer, which is a very topical thing. I also work at Barts in London, and uh, I also uh, work at this place here. It used to be called the ICRF. It's next to the Royal College of Surgeons in the Lincoln Field. I still call it the ICRF, but now we have to call it the London Research Institute, which is a rather mundane word. But, uh, never mind. So, if you try to think about um, the origins of human cancer, 
quite clear that all epithelial tumours go through a pre-invasive state. I mean, if any, any, any tissue you think of, prostate, skin, gut, they all have a pre-invasive state. And so when you're having this, it's really to understand how mutations become fixed in that epithelial sheet, prostate, in the ducts of the breast, or in the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. And how, once they get fixed, how do they spread? Because this happens in all tumors. And if you're trying to think about the origin of the tumors, that's the way in which you should think about it. And I want to give homage to another surgeon, a man called Slaughter, who published a paper in 1953, on what he called the Sophia cancerization hypothesis, which I think surgeons with a great deal of imagination embraced immediately. But pathologists, oncologists, cancer biologists have totally neglected this, and it's only in the last three or four years that this hypothesis has really come into its own with the advent of genetic techniques for studying it. And he was looking at oral and uh, uh, tumors of the, the area digestive tract, and he found you know, they, they were, there was, there was, there was a field change, and he thought, and this was the uh, implication of the multicentric origin of these tumors. And what he's saying, in fact, is you have a tumour down here, but the surrounding tissue has changes which are quite far advanced on the pathway towards that lesion. And this explains why you have multiple tumours occurring in all manner of epithelia, like the urethelium, and the breast as well. So you have this field cancerization effect. I just want to stop and show you a patient. Now, this was done in my lab by a lady called Susan Gallant, who was a professor of surgery at the Louisville University on sabbatical in my lab. And this shows a quite remarkable patient. And I just want to take you through this if I can. In fact, some of it's uh, complex about that there. This was a patient who had Crohn's disease and died this in 1996. And you can see here, um, uh, there's a tissue removed from his, uh, his rectum and the sigmoid down here, which was P53 wild type. And then in the year 2000, there was a, uh, a mutation found in P53. In this case, it's been at uh, 731 in the rectum. But then in 2001, this new mutation that appeared at 724. You can see it there. It's occupying this entire segment of the bowel, going up into the transverse colon. So, encrypted the sequence all the way up here, and they have this mutation at the same time as, as LOH at 72 q um, not, not much change in 2003, more tissue was acquired. But then in 2004, look what's happened. This same mutation has spread all the way up the gut, right across to the um, hepatic flexure here, down here, producing lesions as it goes. This is all the same mutation. It's got down to the ionocecal valve, actually crossed the ionocecal valve, and is involved in a dysplastic lesion in the terminal line. So this mutation has spread all the way through, re retrogradely through the gut. And I think it's quite a remarkable thing, especially the fact it's actually switched, crossed over the IC valve, and has formed the lesions here. So how has that mutation got from here all the way around to here? And I think that's a very interesting question, and one which I hope I'm going to try and persuade you I know the answer to. You may not agree. Um, so what's going on here? Well, this is the sort of thing we like to think about the colorectal cancer. We have these uh, aberrant foci, adenoma carcinoma, the well-known adenoma carcinoma sequence, and we chalk in these changes in APC around the PPC3 as though we know what's happening. Um, but this is what really happens in colorectal cancer. I think a lot of people don't really appreciate that, that cancer is not just mutation. Mutations mean nothing. It's mutation and selection. Because unless that mutation is selected for in the population, it won't survive. So it's mutation and selection. So what happens? You have a cell down here with the first mutation, and that mutation has got to provide some sort of survival advantage, which selects that clone. And then you have another mutation, and the further clone comes on, another mutation, selective advantage, another mutation, and four or five mutations which are required before you actually get a so it's mutation and selection. So don't let anybody tell you that mutations are that important because the re recent uh, whole genome uh, analysis of tumors show that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mutations. And most of these are passengers. And the driver mutations that actually drive the tumor are very few and far between. And they're the ones that are selected for. So the, the question we're all interested in 
question. Is this a stem cell? Do you actually have a stem cell that occurs in the tumor? You know, people say, well, it must be a stem cell, because a stem cell is the only cell that hangs around long enough to accumulate all these particular mutations. And there's something in that, because in the coli, for example, the cells which come from the stem cell are discarded within three or four days. So common sense would dictate it's a stem cell. And then you have the also the vexatious question is what's the relationship between the organ specific tissue stem cells and the so called cancer stem cells if you believe in them, the Di Maria and, uh, and John Dickens showed in colorectal cancer, see uh, well, the positive cells, which are able to drive tumors in, 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 in Zika. So there's a lot of unknown questions here. Is this a stem cell? What's the relationship between this stem cell and those so called cancer stem cells? It's a, a bit of a hot spot.